Potter's Journal. It is now late March 2019. Um, my studio time is going to be limited here to Sundays maybe, hopefully. I'll be more busy at the nursery. Uh, the snow is now sadly gone in my backyard. Um, however, there's still some in the mountains. Maybe we'll take the snowboard up to uh, Laurel Mountain. I learned there in the 60s. Um, still uh, things to learn there today and yes maybe we can learn something here in the pottery it is time to do something more radical with the pots I am going to with my uh, cone 6 oxidation and my jug series do a mad glaze session and we're going to throw ash and glass on the pieces and see what happens I just finished a mad glaze session for my one of one of 100 jugs. I'm um, using some of my own glazes, some commercial glazes. I've been referring to Michael Cardew's Pioneer Potter. Um, there's the new glazes back there. Um, trying to take things that worked for me once and do them again. Okay, but it doesn't always work that way that I um, thought this one came out just magic with the uh, what I got here and tried to do it again and it just didn't come out quite the same not that it's not something you'd look for in a jug but um, always um, yeah a little bit bigger chance when you're doing it on a bigger one and that's what we're doing now the combination here is standard ceramics molten green transparent and their cork um, medium cork over top of it I've got some drips and I've scattered some ash on it too so this is what I'm looking for we'll see what we get <laughs> okay and the next combo okay once again it was just magic here when we got the ghost images radiating up from glaze that was actually dripping down upside down and the blue halos around the fingerprints the underglaze is um, Dale's uh, or no, pale seaweed. The underglaze is standards pale seaweed, and the over is their um, sea mist. And on the second one, it just didn't work quite the same. So we'll see what happens with the big one, and we've got a scattering of ash on it. Okay, next combo. This one has worked reliably for me my true Albany slip glaze I've still got a 50 pound sack and a full bucket with standard sea mist over top of it this one has worked for me reliably over and over again but not every time <laughs> with such nice fingerprints like we have here so we'll see what happens now on the bigger one once again with the scattering of ash on it and the Albany slip glaze again um, it worked once with the brushwork underneath however this was a lighter clay body I am going to try it again though on the bigger jug with the scattering of ash and some texture in there that this glaze always um, seems to catch and show off as we can see there with the XXX and again here and here we got some kiln tears except they were placed there intentionally and this is where Cardew's discussion of the leech teaching and philosophy that uh, the accidents can be more beautiful than things uh, you try to do or not um, necessarily not beautiful but if they're forced or contrived or added intentionally that's a different thing well I don't know it seems that either way they could be ugly or beautiful that um, many of those pieces that get the kiln drips may end up in the shard bin so 
We'll see what happens. I'm going to try a Coke bottle this time. The blue glass was a little rough, but this is cone 6 oxidation. We'll see what happens. Still a few more pots. I'm going to show you how that mad glaze session went, but I've been tripping over these boots all winter long. Maybe I will get to use them. And Oh, I didn't even know about that. I forgot. Look at that. A vintage Burton snowboard jacket from the early 90s. Actually, this is vintage too. They don't, um, I don't think even do step-ins like that anymore. Okay, let's get back to the mad glaze and get this kiln loaded. Yeah. Okay, one more. Here's how that mad glaze session went. Okay, I am putting a little bit of glaze on the bottom to get it in the, um, signature and in the stamp, the one of 101 jugs, and then we are, okay, rubbing it off so there's not much on there, but just enough so that it's in the uh, stamp, since this is a special series, and we want to accent that, let it be well known, yell it out clear and loud. splash up and leave some splash marks for us. Um, when I do this, I have been removing that drip. Um, hmm, sometimes you want them and sometimes you don't. Okay, and the next part, okay, um, you know what, we're going to continue that finger mark thing on the side with the real thin coat of glaze. Um, and, um, okay. And let that dry just a bit. Okay, and while that's drying just a bit, those, um, okay, Coke bottle. I've got a real heavy duty, and I better not do this here over my glazes, heavy duty wax coated bag. That was the Albany slip is the first layer, and the second layer is the sea mist. And we are going to see if we can get some finger marks up on the top. And I predetermine where I want to come down to. Sometimes they're there, and sometimes they are not. And while it's wet, this is where we will do the smathering of ash. And... Get out of here. Do not want it to drip down on the shelf, but um, okay, a little bit of glaze to get it to stick. And okay, any of the pieces that I did put that on, I put on also a broken shelf in the kiln just because I don't want anything to drip. But these are, it's a relatively small piece, we'll see what happens. Okay, that's how the mad glazing session went. Let's hope that um, the kiln firing isn't mad, but we say that it, this was all brilliant. <laughs>
the ash is a bit rough on your kiln elements it's not immediate death here's where we don't want to take any chances I did find the helmet I'm determined to see that this happens this year uh, but stick around first we've got to finish this mad glaze session and get the kiln loaded another late night glazing this time to get the small pieces to go on the bottom of the kiln under these I wanted these on the top because I didn't want a 10 inch uh, post down at the bottom to move around not that they're it's unstable um, and then to make sure I had enough room for them on the top well I put the measure down in there but I've done that before and found out then when I got to the top I was that much short so what I did was took the stilts and stacked them in there a couple little pieces of broken shelf and then measured from the top up and there's enough clearance for these guys and even an extra half inch so we worked that out um, I've got a piece of broken kiln shelf in I do want to get the at least one of the ones with the glass in here and one with the face and I'm just going to put, see what will fit in here and then adjust. Um, let's see, I have how many different combinations. You know what, this combination is relatively the same, so I will just get one of these in. And it looks like if I adjust this right, we can get about five in here. I'm going to leave, you know, roughly a quarter of an inch between pieces and always anxious when these are our first fairly big jugs um, I want to next make the next size up and there is room in the very center for something um, hmm what can we find to put in there oh great there isn't anything Okay, well, we will do one more <laughs> late night mad glaze session. Um, and it's, you know, relatively small kiln. It's not like we're filling up multi chambers or a uh, huge, um, this one behind me, 16 cubic foot. Um, so, um, but I will put this bottom on low now. I usually put it on low overnight and then take it up during the day. I've been on the glaze. Um, because you need uh, so many, uh, several of the glazes need a soak at the end to mature the glaze, make sure there's no bubbles. Nobody's really said how you do that if you don't have, uh, if you have a manual kiln, not computer operated. So I've been just turning it down two notches and um, setting a timer on the kitchen stove for uh, 20 minutes. Uh, but the last two I've tried something different. I've turned it down three notches and just left it on for um, half an hour and one time it was 45 minutes and everything came out smooth and clean. Um, I'm also uh, trying to speed up the early parts of the firing and see how fast I can do it. Um, so it might not be the how uh, yeah. Um, the fast up to a certain point and then slow on the final and then the soak thing so but I now want to work on um, you know the fine details and making sure that you know I do it as fast as I can so it's as efficient I efficient as it can be so I'm keeping um, notes and records okay one more piece to get in there so there's the old lodge here on Laurel Mountain and here is an old rope tow line. So if I'm thinking this is hard today, imagine going up this hill on a rope tow. Okay, I've done it with a snowboard and a T-bar. That's pretty tough. But wow, imagine that. Okay, vintage photo I learned here in the 1960s something, maybe 66, 68, um, something like that. Um, it's important if you're skiing on snow or working with clay, stick with it for many years and you'll be 
um, doing stuff new and on the vintage board as well. And here at Laurel Mountain, there is no need for a vacuum cleaner. They have got a mascot running around to keep, greet people and to clean up the floor. Hey, Laurel. You're keeping the floor clean, huh?